Welcome back to 10 News Conference. We're speaking with Jack Reed about some of the uh, foreign relations that are being yeah. undertaken by the, the Trump uh, administration. Do you think they did a good job in sending a message regarding the sarin gas attack in Syria? Yeah. Uh, now the, uh, the focus kind of shifts over to North Korea. Right, right. And uh, he, he talked about sending uh, Navy ships over there. The Carl Vincent Battle Group, yeah. Uh, and, but they didn't go there. Right. Uh, which I, I don't know if that's good or bad, but he uh, clearly is trying to engage China in, in dealing with this situation. This uh, the right approach? Well, it's appropriate to involve China in it, but you know, I think the situation in North Korea and the situation in Syria have similar but There's no overall strategy. The president appears to, to reacting to events on an ad hoc way. And I think to what he would have to do, I think not only to help the long-term strategy, but also reassure the American public that he is fully versed and, you know, knowledgeable about what is being done, is that he should publicly give a very thoughtful speech about his strategy both in Syria and in North Korea. In North Korea, he has recognized uh, that China has probably got the most leverage. It might not have complete total leverage, but mm -hmm. it has the most leverage economically. They've stopped accepting some coal deliveries. Uh, they're talking about other sanctions, but last year their trade actually went up with North Korea. But the Chinese, I, they have to be part of this, and I, I, that uh, approach is appropriate. I think you know, getting the whole area, the Japanese, the South Koreans, all working together with the United States is absolutely critical. This is a very dangerous situation. They have nuclear devices. They're trying to develop long-range missiles. They have chemical weapons. They have a huge standing army, over a million people. They have an incredible concentration of artillery just about 25 miles away from Seoul, 30 miles. And Seoul is a city of 25 million people, a huge metropolitan area, which could be subject to conventional tax. This is very serious. We have 28,000 troops in Korea. So it calls for a strategy, and the president has to articulate it. We're, what is the long-run approach? Uh, what are we trying to do, both publicly, and he doesn't necessarily have to comment on private diplomacy, but that should be going on, too. And I think until he does that, the American people won't have confidence in what he's doing. Do you have some confidence that he is evolving as, as a president, that he is learning that some of these situations have nuances and complications? Well, I, 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 I don't think he's demonstrated that yet, because, again, I think if he is able to stand up and give a you know, very thoughtful you know, speech that tells the American people, you know, I understand, I have a long view, we have a short view, intermediate steps we'll take, et cetera, that would go a long way. But again, what we have been getting is random tweets. Uh, we've been getting uh, flip-flops of amazing uh, proportions. Uh, he was going to declare China as a currency manipulator. Now he's not. Uh, he, he thought the Chinese could take care of this in just about 24 hours. He discovers, no, they don't have all the right, leverage. Right, so isn't this to speak to evolution? I mean, he realizes now you can't... Uh, I don't think it speaks to evolution more than it speaks to kind of a sort of... Uh, uh, changing positions because he never really thought those positions were, you know, sincerely believed in the first place. And then second, it, it's kind of a sort of an intermittent in and out. You know, I, I'll deal with this issue for a minute and then I'll move to another issue, then I'll move to another issue. And then the other factor too, which in the long run could be very detrimental, is there's, there's a significant gap in filling positions in both the Department of Defense and the State Department. There are about 40 key positions in defense that he hasn't even nominated anyone to. Similarly, in the State Department. And if you're going to conduct a foreign policy, you've got to have not only a White House staff and a president, you have to have the, the real experts and the implementers, people in the Department of Defense, civilian appointees, and in the Department of State. So long term, he's going to have a very difficult time translating his strategy into practice without these appointments. And that's their fault. They haven't sent him up to us. Right, but didn't he campaign on the idea that government's too big? And, I mean, you're a defender of big government. You're no, a part I, of it. I, uh, you can talk about making government efficient, and we should. That would be, should be some of our obligations. But you, have, to, smaller, but you have key positions that have to be filled. 
you need expertise, and then you need to carry out the plans. His, he's proposing a huge cut in the State Department budget. And one of the interesting things about uh, our new Secretary of Defense, one of his statements uh, when he was a general in the Marine he said, listen, if you, if you don't invest in State Department people, you have to buy me more ammunition because there will be a fight. We won't be able to avoid it. So, again, I, I don't think this represents an evolution. I think it represents being sort of confronted with issues, dealing with on a short-term ad hoc basis, and then just moving on to the next issue. So you think this uh, lack of filling positions in the State Department is going to have consequences long term? It's going to have consequences. And we'll, we'll see more of the problems that that causes in years to come. Well, we saw in some respects with this issue of the Colin Vincent Battle Group. They were in the Pacific, and the President and his staff made an announcement that they were steaming towards uh, career. It turned out they were steaming the opposite direction, and and they are only turning around recently and going up there. But all of the the, the tweets and all the other stuff is I've sent an armada there, etc. That's either sort of trying to bluff the North Koreans, or it was miscommunication between the Navy, the Department of Defense, and the White House. Some of that is because they're key policy people that aren't in place. Is some of it that? Maybe the president is crazy like a fox, that he's trying to act like he hit uh, a trigger and watch it or I'll blow you up? Uh, th that is a very, I think, dangerous approach to foreign policy, p particularly with uh, regimes like North Koreans. Mm -hmm. You know, you might be able to get away with it on a one-off business deal where you can walk away and, you know, that deal goes through, doesn't go through or goes through. But part of this, uh, I'm unpredictable, it not only uh, creates Im impressions with our potential adversaries, but also our allies are wondering what's going on, whether he'll be with them when it counts, whether, whether we'll be consistent in our policy. So there's a cost to this, and, uh, you know, and particularly in this last situation with, with Korea, with, in South Korea, when they realized that that carrier group, the Vincent Carrier Group, wasn't going towards North, uh, North Korea, in South Korea, there was a lot of just con concern, uh -huh. great concern, because people who wanted to see a strong response were disappointed. People who were afraid of a re response were shocked that they'd be sort of told this. So again, that's an example of a, a foreign policy that in the short run might have an effect, but in the long run it has cost. All right, we're going to take another commercial break, and we'll talk about some domestic issues coming up with U.S. Senator Jack Reed.